Welcome to this webinar entitled Penetration and Aspiration. How common are they in healthy swallowing? My name is Katrina Steele and I will be the speaker for this webinar. And I'm pleased to be sharing the content of a talk that I delivered at the ASHA convention in November 2019 in Orlando. Before I get into the content, I do have some disclosures that are shown here on this slide. Perhaps most importantly that I'm a board member of IDSI, the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. And I'd also like to acknowledge my fabulous team at the Steel Swallowing Lab back at KITE, which is the research arm of the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, who contribute actively to the work that I will be discussing today. There is a handout for this webinar, which you can download at the address shown on the screen. So we're here today to talk about airway invasion during swallowing, which we call either penetration or aspiration, depending on how far down the bolus travels into the upper airway. Here on the slide, I'm showing the eight-point penetration aspiration scale developed by Dr. Rosenbeck and colleagues and published first in 1996. And I'm assuming that you're already well familiar with this scale. It really has become the industry standard for describing these events of airway invasion. It's important to know that there are eight levels on this scale, and there is some debate about whether these levels are ordinal, meaning that each higher level is more severe than the preceding level. But this scale is certainly not what we call interval in that there is no such thing as a decimal place to qualify slightly more severe or slightly less severe event on the scale. So, for example, a scale score of 4.2 is simply a scale score of 4. Uh, whether the scale is ordinal, as I've mentioned, is a question in the literature at the moment, but at minimum, the scale has what we call categorical properties so that you can describe each event based on the descriptors in the scale. As described by the authors of the scale, a score of 1 is considered completely normal with no material entering the airway. Scores of 2 to 5 were originally grouped in the category of penetration. So here we have a situation where material does enter the airway and it travels into the supraglottic space or laryngeal vestibule and at scores of four and five it may travel even as far down as the true vocal folds. Scores of two and four indicate situations where this penetration material is then ejected back out of the airway so that at the end there's nothing left in the airway. And scores of 3 and 5 contrast with those scores in that the material remains in that supraglottic space and is not ejected. Scores of 6, 7, and 8 on the scale are considered to represent true aspiration. At a level of 6 on the scale, that material is ejected back above the vocal folds, but at scores of 7 and 8, the material remains below the true vocal folds in the trachea. At scores of seven, the patient has tried to clear that material through either throat clearing or spontaneous coughing. But at a score of eight, we have a situation of true silent aspiration where there is no overt sign that the patient is aware at all of that material and there's no coughing or throat clearing. In the years since the original publication of the scale, there's been some debate about whether a score of two is really a score that should raise concern. And I'm going to take you through some papers that speak to this, but today it's generally true that a score of two is considered to be a transient event of little concern because it does appear to occur in healthy people. If you have never done so, I really strongly encourage you to go back to the original article published by Rosenbeck and colleagues in 1996 and read about the scale's development. In fact, you'll discover when you do that that there were originally nine levels on the scale and they ultimately decided to collapse that to eight levels. And the place where there was a possible additional level 
is around the score of 6. So today the scale describes a score of 6 as material that enters the airway and travels down below the true vocal folds but is then ejected either into the supraglottic space or out of the airway. And those two ultimate locations where the material is ejected were originally two different possible scale scores. On this slide, you can see the methods that were used for the scale development. So in this study, four judges uh, rated, using the descriptors that they had developed, 75 examples of thin bolus swallows. And these came from 15 patients who had presumably relatively severe dysphagia due to multiple strokes. And the ratings were performed in duplicate. And what you can see on the right-hand side of the slide is the number of times or the percent frequency of the different scores on the scale in that particular data set. So I just want to take a moment to look at that with you and point out that about one-third of the swallows from these 15 patients uh, had completely normal swallowing with no airway invasion. And then about another 19% had penetration aspiration scale scores of 2 with transient penetration into the laryngeal vestibule that was ultimately ejected. So if you add those together, we see that about half of the swallows from these patients with dysphagia really had scores of no concern. About another quarter of the data, 23%, showed penetration into the laryngeal vestibule, but not down as far as the vocal folds that was not ejected. And then another 6% at scores of 5, where that material traveled as far as the vocal folds and wasn't ejected. So at this point, we've accounted for almost three quarters of the data set. And you can see that the other scores were much less common particularly for scores of 4 and 6, where the material enters the laryngeal vestibule as far as the vocal folds or below and then is ejected. So that really was a very rare event in that particular data set. And it's interesting to note that that continues to be a trend in subsequent papers that have reported the full detail of penetration aspiration scale scoring. So in this data set, we had about one quarter of the swallows in total where there was aspiration below the true vocal folds that was not ejected, qualifying either for a score of 7 or 8. As I mentioned earlier, there's been some debate in the field since the introduction of the penetration aspiration scale about whether any of these events occur in healthy swallowing. And there's been particular focus on scale scores of two of transient penetration. But in 2006, really one of the only papers that has looked at this so far was published by Alicia Daggett from Dr. Logeman's lab looking at penetration during swallowing in healthy adults. And as you can see on this slide, she had a pretty big sample of almost 100 people with a broad age span. And these individuals completed a full video fluoroscopy protocol with several different volumes of thin liquid, as well as three mil boluses of pudding, and some solid items as shown on the slide, and they did two boluses of each presentation. And what you can see here in this table is the frequency data with which penetration was seen on the different tasks in the Daggett protocol. And I want to point out here that there are different frequencies depending on whether you look at this at the bolus level or the person level. So of all of the boluses that were collected in that protocol, you can see highlighted that the most common task with which penetration was seen was the 10 milliliter thin liquid task. And 20% of those 10 milliliter thin boluses showed penetration in these healthy adults. Um, certainly this finding suggests that there might be something about the volume, although notably the cup drinking task that followed had a lower frequency of penetration. And you can see at the bottom that penetration on the 
paste or pudding and cookie and apple tasks was very, very rare in this sample. But I think it's important to just process that although 20% of the boluses showed penetration, when you look at that in terms of how many people of the 98 participants in this study showed penetration on each of these tasks, the numbers look a little different. And this reflects the fact that people don't always show penetration on every repetition of the task. And so of the two boluses of each of these tasks, um, not everybody showed penetration on both of those boluses. So overall, about one third of the participants in this study showed penetration on the 10 milliliter thin task, and about 25% of them showed penetration on the cup drinking or the five milliliter thin task. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago that the Daggett study had a broad age span from 20 to 94 amongst its healthy participants. And so this enabled Daggett and colleagues to explore a question that's asked commonly by clinicians, which is, do people who are older have a greater frequency of airway invasion events? So here you can see that there was a statistically significant difference in the frequency of penetration events between older and younger adults divided at age 50. If we look at the thin liquid data, you can see in the pink bars, which is the person level data, that about 30% of the adults under age 50 had penetration on thin liquid but approximately 65 to 70% of the older cohort had penetration on those thin liquid stimuli. So definitely it appears that the problem of penetration was more common in the older individuals. And then on the right hand side of the slide, you can see that there were no penetration events at all on the solid food stimuli in the younger participants. And we had up to about 16%, I would say, uh, on the food stimuli in the older cohort. So the Daggett study simply used the word penetration to describe the airway invasion events that they reported in their study. They didn't break it down by the different penetration aspiration scale score levels. And I'm quite interested in this phenomenon of transient penetration that would yield a, a penetration aspiration scale score of two, or perhaps a four, where material enters the airway and remains in the laryngeal vestibule or travels down as far as the true vocal folds, but is then completely ejected from the airway. And this video shows an example of that transient penetration with a penetration aspiration scale score of two. These still shots on this slide capture some relevant frames for you to focus your eyes on this event. So on the left hand side we have the area of the laryngeal vestibule outlined at rest. And on the right I've captured the frame where material seems to have entered that supraglottic space or laryngeal vestibule and from which it is then subsequently ejected. I think it's important just to make a comment that in the development of the penetration aspiration scale, Rosenbeck and colleagues did not imply that this ejection phenomenon from the laryngeal vestibule or from the level of the true vocal folds requires some sort of conscious event on the part of the patient. It doesn't require a cough or a throat clearing activity and indeed Given the sensory nerve supply to this area, it's not likely that we would see a cough response to a penetration event because we're in the region of the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. And when that nerve's receptors are excited, the expected response is actually a swallow rather than a cough. It's only when material travels below the true vocal folds into the territory of the recurrent laryngeal nerve that we expect to see a cough as the reflex response. So as described by Rosenbeck and colleagues, 
simply biomechanical movement of the tissues and structures in this area can be enough to squeeze that uh, penetrated material back out of the airway as the swallow uh, evolves. So we've had a couple of opportunities to look at this question of how often transient penetration occurs in healthy swallowing. And the first of those is shown here on the slide. This is data from the doctoral research of my previous student, Dr. Sonia Malfenter. And as part of Dr. Malfenter's dissertation research, she collected video fluoroscopy data in a cohort of 20 healthy adults under the age of 40. Half of them were men and half of them were women. And in that study, these participants swallowed uh, several different stimuli as shown in the graph on the slide. So they began with a low concentration barium in a teaspoon volume of five milliliters. They then continued to swallow that same stimulus in larger volumes, so a 10 milliliter bolus and a 20 milliliter bolus. And then we did a 40% barium concentration in the five milliliter volume and a nectar thick barium in the five milliliter volume. I should uh, disclose that these stimuli were not the Varibar stimuli, which we unfortunately can't access in Canada. So these stimuli were prepared using another commercially available barium at the time. And you can see here the number of participants or the percent of participants who showed penetration aspiration scale scores of two, that's the transient penetration on these different boluses. So this is a bolus level presentation of the frequency of this phenomenon. So you can see that on the five milliliter thin uh, task at the 20% concentration of barium, 2% of the data showed penetration aspiration scale scores of two. Uh, and then with the larger volumes of 10 and 20 milliliters, that increased to 10% of the boluses. Notice that we had absolutely no events of penetration on the 40% thin barium and the nectar thick barium. When we look at this at the participant level rather than the bolus level, uh, it turned out that these scores of two on the penetration aspiration scale came from only two of the 20 participants. We've also had a second opportunity to look at this question of penetration or aspiration in healthy adults in our current NIH funded research looking at the physiological flow of liquids that are used in dysphagia management. And to date, we've got data on 51 healthy adult participants. 40 of those are under the age of 60, and then the remainder are over the age of 60, and we're continuing to collect in that older cohort. So the data I'm able to share with you today come from 27 women and 24 men, and you can see that we have quite a broad age span here from 21 to 70 in this particular analysis. So the questions we can ask from this data set at this point include, how common is penetration and aspiration in healthy adults? And here we're looking at a series of three repeated swallows of thin liquid barium in each person. And we used a non-cued swallow paradigm where the person self-administered a naturally sized sip from a cup containing that thin liquid barium. We're also particularly interested to understand the frequency of different scores on the penetration aspiration scale, and particularly how often we see scores of two versus scores of three and higher on the scale. And finally, we are interested to understand whether the frequency of penetration differs according to the consistency of the liquid that we are using and how thickened liquids impact the frequency of airway invasion in these healthy participants. This slide illustrates the protocol that we've used in this study. So as mentioned, everybody began with three natural sips of that thin liquid barium. And then they continued progressively onto the thicker consistencies. We had three boluses 
of each thickness that were thickened with a starch thickener and three that were thickened with a gum thickener. And today I'll be really looking only at the xanthan gum thickened set. So in our lab, we follow a standard operating procedure for video fluoroscopy rating for research purposes. And that begins by taking each video fluoroscopy recording and carving it up into smaller, shorter clips uh, so that we have one video per bolus. And those boluses are then randomly assigned to the raters for rating. We always do duplicate rating for our research. And so the two raters are blinded to each other's uh, decisions. And then any time that we have disagreements, we flag those and take those to a meeting for consensus building. So the first three steps in the rating procedure are shown here on the slide, starting with that clipping or splicing activity. And then when a rater receives a video that they're supposed to rate, the first thing we ask them to do is count the number of swallows that they see per bolus. And then for each of those swallows, we ask them to assign a penetration aspiration scale score. So they're looking at each and every swallow. If a patient swallows more than once, they would have more than one penetration aspiration scale score. And then as we summarize at the bolus level, we look for the worst score across the swallows for that bolus. And if we were summarizing at the participant level, we would look at each task, so each consistency, and summarize with the worst penetration aspiration scale score that we see across the boluses delivered in that consistency. So this slide shows you the frequency of penetration aspiration scale scores from levels one to five on the penetration aspiration scale for the 155 thin liquid boluses that we have in this data set. So by the fact that the graph ends at a score of five, that can tell you that we had absolutely no events of aspiration in this data set. I also want to point out that the average sip volume of these natural sips was 12 milliliters, and you can see the 95% confidence interval for that on the slide. And so this is pretty close to that 10 milliliter volume that Daggett studied, and presumably is also close in volume to the SIP tasks that Daggett included and to the SIP tasks that might be included, for example, in the MBS IMP protocol. You can see here that by far the majority of the boluses that we have of thin liquid showed penetration aspiration scale scores of one. And then uh, another 10% showed scores of two. And that we had two boluses of each of the scores of three, four, and five in the data set, representing together only 3% of the data. So clearly these events of scores higher than one are unusual on thin liquid in these healthy participants, but we do see approximately 10% of scores of two on the scale. As was the case in Daggett's study, it's not necessarily true that the same person would show a penetration event on more than one bolus. And so when we take those scores and look at how many people showed a worst score of two or higher, you can see those results here. So 38 of our 51 participants had no airway invasion events at all. Nine of them showed transient penetration, those scores of two on the scale. And then in total, we had four people who showed scores of three, four, or five. So our data corroborate the findings of Daggett that penetration does occur occasionally in healthy adults. And when it does occur, it's most commonly a score of two that gets ejected. And we have very rare occurrences of scores of three and five. And those data are all for thin liquids. So overall, when we look at the participant level, 25% of our sample of healthy adults aged 20 to 94 showed a penetration event, a score of two, three, four, or five on the thin liquid task. 
So what about the thicker liquids that we had available? And as mentioned here, I'm talking about the xanthan gum thickened stimuli. And what you can see here on the slide are that we had a significant reduction in penetration aspiration scale scores of two or higher on the slightly thick and mildly thick liquids. So it jumped from 25% down to 14%. And then we had a further statistically significant reduction on the even thicker stimuli, the moderately and extremely thick stimuli. One possible compound that I should acknowledge here is that because the moderately thick and extremely thick stimuli are difficult to sip from a cup, they were served with a teaspoon. And so we know that the volume of those stimuli was hovering around that five six milliliter level, which was the capacity of the spoon. And so the volumes of those stimuli were smaller than the volumes we used for the thinner stimuli. So when we look at those frequencies, we're actually able to calculate odds ratios to reflect the relative risk of material entering the airway with these consistencies. And you can see here that compared to thin liquid, the odds are almost three times lower with slightly thick and liquids thicker than that compared to thin. And as we go thicker, the relative risk gets even smaller. So the odds are four to six times lower as the bolus gets progressively thicker. So it, this really does confirm that it's less likely that material will get into the airway uh, with these thicker consistencies. And when we look into the details of those penetration aspiration scores by consistency, you can see here that we've, we've graded the uh, bars on the chart. So the solid bars show the scores of one, so no airway invasion by consistency. And you can see that that ranges from 75% of the data on the um, thin liquid and up to 96% of the participants with the extremely thick stimuli. And then in the middle with the diagonally hashed bars, we see the scores of two. And then at the top for the thin, the mildly, and the extremely thick liquids, we also have a very small number of participants who showed scores of three or higher as previously described. And this chart just shows you what those events of three and higher were of the 255 boluses in the entire data set. There were seven of these events that you can see in those cells, and they came from five people. And you can see clearly that these scores of three, four, and five were most common on the thin liquid stimulus. And then we had two events on the mildly thick and one on the extremely thick. So to summarize the information that I presented in this talk today, then our data corroborate evidence that's previously been reported in the literature that on sips of thin liquids, we do sometimes see penetration in healthy people. And in fact, in our data set of healthy adults, up to 25% of these people showed a penetration event on the thin liquid. When it happens, that penetration event is usually a score of two on the penetration aspiration scale, meaning that the phenomenon is transient. We have material dipping into the laryngeal vestibule, but then being squeezed or ejected back out and leaving no material in the vestibule. And these scores that are more severe than that of three or higher on the penetration aspiration scale are very rare. And we saw absolutely no events in this data set of true aspiration with scores of six, seven, or eight. Furthermore, our data corroborate other evidence to suggest that the odds of material entering the airway are significantly lower with thicker consistencies than they are with thin. So overall, these events should be unexpected in healthy adults with thicker consistencies.
So with that, I will conclude this webinar recording. If you do have questions about this topic, feel free to send us a message at the email shown on this slide. And I encourage you also to follow us at our Twitter handle or on our Facebook page. Thank you for your attention.